future's point of view are there some issues that you and I should be aware of uh, as we look down the road here a bit. Uh, we also have an interesting mix of people on the panel. We have two exchanges and we have two traders. So what I'd like to start with uh, is have everybody just give us a brief introduction about uh, who you are and what you do. Uh, hi, my name is Bruce Wisner. Uh, I've been a trader since 1988. I became a member of the Chicago Board of Trade and traded in a 30-year treasury bond pit uh, until the mid-90s. Uh, when I started, uh, I switched over to trade uh, equities off the floor. Uh, and I became a member of the CBOE in 1997 and started financing traders on a model that I designed. And by 2000, I had about 40 traders uh, trading my model. We were probably doing about 20 million shares a day. Uh, and I sold out of that in 01 and uh, just continually traded for myself. But I recently got involved with a New York clearing firm and now I'm a partner uh, in a group called WTS Proprietary Trading. We're out of New York and uh, I uh, uh, basically am the managing partner of the Chicago office at the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. Hello, uh, my name is Rob Smith and uh, I started in this business when I was 15 on the CBOE as a as a clerk for Merrill Lynch, and I worked every summer, and then became a member of the Chicago Stock Exchange for 16 years. I was a uh, independent trader, uh, listed specialist, OTC specialist uh, during my tenure there. Uh, I also did a lot of technical research, and now uh, run my own trading firm where we trade my proprietary strategy. Uh, I educate people and then fund traders, and uh, that's what we're doing today. So <laughs> nice to be here. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Ali Kaplu uh, from the other side of the world. <laughs> I am the uh, head of IT, uh, Information Technology Department at Borsa Istanbul uh, in Turkey. Uh, we used to use the name Istanbul Stock Exchange before. Last year, we went through some actually mergers, which we will talk later today. We merged with the uh, uh, Turkish Derivative Exchange as well as Istanbul Gold Exchange, which I will tell you a little bit more later. Um, I have been in the IT industry for almost 20 years. I am a computer science or computer engineer by education. Uh, I have worked in the IT departments of Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Eshow and Company, uh, and several other retail banks. Uh, and for the past two years, I have been with the Borsa Istanbul. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ivan Takisan. I'm uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Bulgarian Stock, Stock Exchange. I, I joined the, the BSC team in 2001 and uh, was appointed as uh, CEO in 2008, before joining uh, the BSC team, uh, I spent th three years as a securities regulator in Bulgaria. The exchange itself is, uh, has been fully electronic since, since day one, when it was uh, actually launched in 1997. Uh, uh, it's a small-sized exchange, uh, the only one in Bulgaria, and we trade predominantly equities and some bonds as well. Great, thank you. I just give you a little my background. I, I'm a trader and I come to the markets from a floor point of view on the equity as uh, equity option is also on the future side and I have a chance to share ideas on trading strategies and techniques with a variety of institutions around the world. I've dealt with over 450 institutions, over 30 exchanges uh, and it's a word of mouth network which <laughs> amazes the heck out of me actually. But uh, but it's something I enjoy doing, so that's a bit about my background. Uh, you know, I think where I'd like to start, though, when we think about technology, and it's really, I suppose, more of an oriented towards the exchange uh, aspect of it, but uh, how about if we have the two exchanges uh, talk about, you know, Ali, maybe you can begin, uh, about some of the technology that you're working on now that you see uh, happening. Uh, sure. I mean, uh, there have been a lot of changes happening in our exchange and obviously uh, technology plays a very, very big role in it. Uh, le let me start uh, with the exchange connectivity speed, the line mm. speed. Uh, when I joined the exchange, it used to be one megabit per second over copper lines. Uh, that is definitely due to the telecommunication infrastructure, obviously. But uh, now today uh, we are uh, allowing our uh, members to connect uh, via fiber. Uh, up to five megabit per second, for example, that's a big change in our world. Uh, we went through a lot of other, uh, you know, throughput and latency improvements uh, in our exchange, mainly in the equities market. Uh, we opened up the options futures, um, uh, index options, sorry, index options uh, last year, about a year ago. Uh, we have been trading um, 
index features for the past seven years, but as I mentioned, it was with a different legal entity called Turkish Derivative Exchange located in Izmir and another city in Turkey. And last year, there was a new capital market law enacted. And as part of that, that capital market law, all these uh, exchanges, uh, Istanbul Gold Exchange, Turkish Derivative Exchange, and Istanbul Stock Exchange were merged and Borsa Istanbul was born. Now everybody, uh, all these trading systems are on the same roof. Uh, we also have a very um, active fixed income bond market. I definitely invite you to uh, look at our statistics if you are into emerging markets. The interest rates are really high, mm. uh, so you can definitely get something out of it. Uh, so uh, o obviously we want to do a lot of other things and we have been going through a transformation as an exchange and technology is a big part of it. Um, looking at the active projects going on, we have signed a strategic partnership deal with NASDAQ OMX recently. That was about uh, officially announced like three months ago, uh, back in uh, February actually, mm -hmm. four months ago. Uh, so we, ha we have been going through an uh, implementation of NASDAQ technology in our exchange, including trading, clearing, surveillance, risk management, data warehouse, uh, like seven different products uh, of NASDAQ technology. And do you still have separate platforms from the other yes, exchanges? Yes, that's exactly so one, is one of our of challenges. So integration process? Ex exactly, that that's one of our challenges because uh, we are, as I said, we are going through a very, very big transformation and we have to keep two systems up and running at the same time for some time. Uh, the NASDAQ, uh, the first phase of NASDAQ will hopefully be ready mid next year. Uh, so till then, the old system has to run. Uh, right after the new technology is ready, we have to go through some market readiness tests. Um, and obviously that's a big challenge because we have a lot of members which has different uh, IT maturity level. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some of them are, uh, have a lot of resources, some of them don't have uh, that much resource and they keep complaining. Uh, so that's one of our challenge and even after that, Equities market will be on the new platform, but the fixed income derivatives and gold will be on the old platform for about a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be a very big challenge for us because if a one member needs to connect to different markets, they have to have different technologies and even the back office is a challenge. Uh, there will be a lot of challenges, but the, if you want to go, you know, do good things and if you want to improve yourself, uh, that's what we have to get to. What, what is the exchange doing? I'm just kind of curious about this because it is kind of a unique situation to have two simultaneous things that you're running. Um, what do you do about margin? Well, how do you handle, uh, because you have two separate platforms. Is correct. There, there's no communication between the platforms, uh, correct? Unfortunately, no. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, each market runs their own uh, margin calculations and other clearing operations. Obviously, that's a little bit of a hassle. You know, uh, but uh, most of our members are uh, just a member of one uh, market, not all of them at the ah, same time. I see. For example, gold, uh, it, it's, it's kind of the members in the gold market is completely different than the others. Uh, so th that kind of helps it a little bit. Fixed income market, for example, retail banks are very active in that space. Uh, but the equity and derivatives are kind of common, mm. meaning a member is... Uh, uh, connecting to uh, two of them at the same time. For those, they have to keep the clearing accounts and margin accounts separately, which obviously uh, produces some additional costs. Yeah, makes sense. That is a really a unique situation exactly, you're faced exactly, with. Yeah, yeah, we are going through a lot of big changes uh, yeah. in our life, including, I mean, we introduced uh, fixed connectivity uh, recently mm. because we used to have our own uh, API called Express API that was written by ourselves uh, 10 years or 12 years ago, uh, which was making the um, uh, co connect new member connectivity time uh, longer, especially if uh, uh, there is a, a non-Turkish uh, domiciled uh, customer wants to connect, they have to write their own API, which takes longer than usual. With fix, uh, now we can also achieve higher uh, speed, see. obviously, as well as a uh, like fast connectivity time. That makes some big sense because now you can communicate to the world in that exactly, sense yeah. by using that protocol. Correct. That's good. Yeah. I Thank mean, you. I have a lot of other things to tell, but <laughs> I, I don't want to stop you. All right. Well, we, we have more time to talk, too. Sure. I don't want to tell us about uh, Bulgaria. Tell us what's going on there as far as technology or new projects that you have coming. Uh, yes. We are just about to emerge on a, um, on a uh, 
tripartite project together with the exchanges in Macedonia and, and Zagreb. They are similar sized exchanges facing similar challenges and uh, obviously the, the ways that uh, they plan to, to solve those challenges are also similar. So uh, we, we recently received a confirmation from the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development about their, their readiness to finance a project that will interconnect the three exchanges. So basically what we are about to do is to set up a, a company. Oh, actually we already set up that co company, but that company will act as a hub. And that hub will be able to route orders received from one of the exchange for execution to, 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 the, to the other two exchanges. For instance, this will allow Bulgarian brokers to, to trade Macedonian and Croatian equities via a single interface. This is obviously of great help for any local investors who want to, to reach uh, more globally. The same goes with, uh, with the Croatian and Macedonian uh, brokers. Uh, of again, uh, of course, this is not something that uh, is able to produce a significant order flow, at least not for, for the time being because the investors in our countries are a bit more conservative. They have been uh, traditionally dominated by individual investors and they prefer to, to stay focused on their home markets. But there is some upside when it comes to the institutional investors. For instance, pension funds in Bulgaria, they have been uh, quite strong, I mean financially, uh, and they are continuing to grow in terms of assets, which means that uh, in one or two years, the local market will become quite tight for them and they will start looking abroad. Of they, they even now they are looking abroad because there are so many, uh, well, uh, good opportunities uh, for investments abroad uh, and uh, most of them are heavily invested in Western Europe, for instance. But, um, but if we provide them with a single point uh, for, uh, for order entry, and if we are able on top of that to join more exchanges, I mean under, under that hub, uh, this will be a, a, a real advantage uh, to them. For so in, in the long run, I expect more institutional trading going through that uh, platform. It will be EU, um, not EU funded, but it will be EBRD funded, which means that we are in a win-win situation. If no one uses the platform, we are still uh, 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 not going to spend our own uh, money. Uh, so uh, again, that, that makes some, some sense. And it's a, a huge challenge because even though the, the exchanges are quite similar in size, uh, they are not similar in terms of regulations, especially Macedonia, which is not part of, of the EU. Right. Uh, and um, uh, we need to harmonize to a certain extent our own regulations. We need to eliminate as uh, much as possible if there are any barriers being uh, in place in order to, to make sure that uh, 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 something is fundamentally flawed with, with that project. And we, of course, we, we need to, to adapt our own IT platform so they are able to communicate with the hub and to make sure that our own customers, our local brokers, are able to, to, to communicate with the hub as well using the protocol that will be uh, um, chosen for, for communication, most likely that will be HICS. So it's a rather ambitious project, but all of the, all of the exchanges are quite determined to work on it and accomplish it right on time. You know, I, I have a question for you. I, I, it, it is a big challenge. And uh, I, how, did, what, how are you going to handle the currency issue? Because you all have three different currencies. It's so if I'm in Bulgaria, if I'm in Sofia, and I want to buy something uh, in Zagreb. Uh, how do I handle the currency? Uh, you have to open an account with a with a uh, Croatian broker, after all. So uh, any currency issues will be resolved at member level. Uh, of course, you will be able to open an account in euro in Croatia, and just uh, th as long as the settlement is b is local. I mean the set of settlement in Croatia is in Croatian Kuna. That means that you will uh, carry certain uh, foreign exchange risk. You need to, you need yeah. to handle that on your own. 
So but this is not going to eliminate all of all of the barriers for for cross trading, but uh, we are just not able to to use a single currency trading. That means adoption of euro by each of uh, 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 the three countries, which is obviously not possible uh, at least for the time being, and especially in the case of Macedonia. Yeah, that, that's a very unique part of that because the issue of obviously capital flows becomes an important part if you and I are going to trade in other countries. And I think it's something that maybe you and I can look at a little bit later on too when we talk about the future of mergers and how we see this blending of what exchanges and when and where. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's really a very, both of you are in very interesting situations. I, I just have one more question before we open up to some other ones is, when I think about challenges, and uh, Ali, you started with it when you said, I remember when we started here, we had a copper wire, that was mm -hmm. our, right? Yeah. So share with us, where is technology in terms of communication? Not so much within the exchange, but once you go outside the exchange, w what, is the, what is it like in, in uh, Istanbul or in Turkey right now for communication technology? If we are talking about uh, telecommunication infrastructure, the connectivity, speed, etc., uh, we have uh, three GSM companies which are very, very active and uh, you can say very innovative in introducing new products, which obviously impacts the way that the businesses are running, mm -hmm. including our capital market infrastructure, obviously. Um, uh, for example, uh, there are new entrants in terms of providing fiber connectivity, for example, Vodafone, uh, we have, uh, Vodafone has a subsidiary in Turkey, for example. They started running their own fiber network. Um, in, in our exchange, for example, in our data center, we do have, we do allow uh, three different uh, GSM operators to have fiber connectivity okay. so okay. that the people can have redundant, uh, you know, connectivity. And we are actually trying to enforce a, a requirement for our members to come to us at least via two different fiber operators. Turkish Telecom is the biggest one, obviously. Mm -hmm. There is Super Online, which is a subsidiary of Flixbus, uh, and there is the Vodafone, uh, is the third one. Uh, so uh, we allow all of them to have their own cables, physical cables, and now we allow them to you know, communicate. We are also looking into a radio link backup uh, career right now, uh, in case something goes wrong with the fiber physical connections. So, I mean, uh, one thing, uh, a general comment I would like to make uh, for the people who are dealing with U.S. exchanges and uh, some of the Western Europe exchanges, this becomes like so pivotal. But uh, this is where we are in our <laughs> exchange mat maturity you know, cycle, right? So we are kind of following a little bit behind. Another, uh, speaking of technology, for example, we built a new data center in our campus uh, in, in the past year. So we, uh, when we will start providing co-location, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully in the next few months, we are very actively working and getting actually a strategic consultant from NASDAQ to share their experiences as part of the strategic partnership deal. Uh, so later this year, we will provide co-location, which will in, uh, you know, uh, reduce the latency uh, less than a one millisecond for uh, one order uh, in the equity market turnaround time, which is a big improvement for us. Uh, so with the co-location, as well as we are uh, going through some horizontal and uh, in, uh, vertical integration, meaning we merged, as I mentioned, with Turkish Derivative Exchange, Istanbul Gold Exchange. We also increased our um, uh, ownership in, in our uh, subsidiary for clearing. So there is a, a clearing company, one clearing company in Turkish, Turkey called Takas Bank. Uh, which uh, currently Borsa Istanbul owns 62% uh, of it. Mm. Uh, so it's the majority you know, shareholder, uh, obviously. There is also a third legal entity uh, for custody purposes. Uh, it's called Central Registry Agency. And Borsa Istanbul owns 65% of that. Uh, well, the reason I'm telling all this is the new capital mark, uh, market law uh, forced certain things to happen. Um, and coming back to technology with our new data center, we will move all the uh, data center of all these three legal entities into the same data center. And just by achieving this, we will reduce the telecommunication bills uh, close to like $50,000 a month. So uh, because each 
state of that there needs to have uh, lines to each other and uh, there are redundant lines there are also uh, lines to the our disaster recovery center in Ankara which mm. is uh, the capital city of uh, Turkey so uh, those are different technology challenges that we are facing and obviously playing a big role in business continuity you know market connectivity the speed etc well, I, I'd say you've come a long ways from that uh, copper wire you were talking about sure, just sure. a few minutes ago. That That's a really a huge yeah, program. Two, two and a half years, by the way. Yeah, it, two and a half years. Two wow, half years, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah. That's really impressive. Uh, we are also going through some demutualization, so don't get surprised if you go for an IPO next year. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, we'll have to. Yeah. Well, with the way you're moving your platform, we'll all be able to trade that probably when right. it comes out. Huh? Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, what about you when it comes to the communication aspect as a, as a technology from an exchange point of view, the ability of how you communicate with your brokers or how the outside traders communicate with the exchange. Is, are there technology challenges you're faced with there or is that pretty well established? And if so, how, how are you going about doing that? They are actually <coughs> pretty well established, but that doesn't mean that that is not something challenging. Uh -huh. um, for us, the, uh, the most challenging part is finding the, the right piece of software that suits our needs best. Uh, the computers uh, have been dominated over our lives for last 15 years, mm -hmm. let's say, so much that even uh, fully electronic exchanges like us have been, uh, uh, finding, uh, have been uh, facing some uh, difficult times finding the right piece of technology. The exchanges are not just uh, uh, an order matching mechanism, order matching piece of software that just basically uh, uh, matches to the certain messages received from its members. Well, they are, but they are not just uh, just uh, that. Uh, there are so many ancillary systems that are growing increasingly more complex over the course of the years that uh, uh, we, as a as a small sized exchange, uh, are having some hard time finding the that piece of software that suits our needs best. Uh, at, well, just as an example, has anyone heard about microwave networks like six years ago? I think they are something that is uh, uh, usually uh, uh, perceived as something that has been here just like that. And um, uh, new and new technologies are constantly emerging and they are not necessarily replacing the old ones microwave networks are not the replacement of, of the traditional fibers and they will never be. Um, so uh, what we need to do is to, to have the knowledge of everything that is out there, how it works, and we have to find the right person to implement that technology in our own exchange. This is, this is also increasingly more difficult because you have to, to have those people that have the best knowledge, they have in-depth knowledge of, uh, of everything that is uh, there and you have to hire that people and make sure that they are constantly involved in your, uh, in your daily affairs. That's definitely a challenge, even for, for, a, for a small exchange like ours, but the level of complexity uh, uh, in the exchanges is, is uh, comparable, even though the trading volumes might differ from this trading venue uh, to, 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 to this trading venue, basically. The, uh, the, the IT systems need mm -hmm. to be in place and, uh, and the level of complexity is similar. Okay, thank you. Well, how about if we, we broaden this a bit and, and think about it from the point of view of what is it that we see for the future when it comes to technology? And you know, I'd like to start with the traders, I guess, on this one. It, when we think about connectivity, I mean, w we have some things in the states that we have in place that enhance that and it's constantly changing. But when you, when you think about something that may enhance your business as a trader, uh, is there any particular technology that floats to the top that you'd like to see? Bruce, do you want to start us and uh, go to Rob? Well, um, I, don't, I don't know specifically as far as uh, technology, a specific piece of equipment um, that I would like to see. Uh, obviously, the technology as far as on the execution side, mm -hmm. the speed of connectivity mm -hmm. from point A to point B is uh, a lot faster and a lot cheaper uh, than it is now. I mean, you know, it's, you know, the 
especially right now, the biggest thing uh, out there is this whole thing with high frequency traders and their capacity to uh, access the markets faster than everybody else. But if you look at how things started out in the 1800s, the reason you became a member of an exchange is because you had access to information faster than everybody else. And then in the 90s, when the chaos theory and uh, uh, some of the other ideas started coming out and some of the black box, mo black box models started coming out, everybody said, you know, they, these people had um, special access as far as if you're talking about that kind of activity. I know when I started my first firm in... Um, in uh, 1997, you know, I had to get T T1 lines for each of my traders, and there are $5,000 a month for a T1 line. And now we have technology and connectivity that is 100 times faster than that for, uh, you know, 90% yeah. less cost than that. So, you know, uh, what I'd like to see, you know, as things continue the way they are, I think the high-frequency trader thing is a, is, a, is a very overblown issue. I uh, actually just read an article today that said that 73% of the volume right now in the markets is from high-frequency traders. And you have to look that our volume is down actually about 65% from the day between 2008 and 2011. So it, it's the connectivity that we have now that's keeping these markets alive as we're getting to higher and higher levels. That's true. That's true. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I wanted to clarify something too because uh, – when with the new book coming out and obviously uh, high frequency trading taking a front and center look and getting a really negative blow that it's more accurate to call it automated trading because there are different parts to it to automated trading where uh, there's the high, high profile now with order jumpers trying to get in front of, of orders uh, which is seen as wrong and there are order stuffers which are actually s stuffing the box with false orders and then there are actual directional trades uh, where automated trading systems are, are directionally trading. So I always like to try and make that point because um, it just gets, the HFT sounds horrible, the automated trading sounds a lot better, especially when you consider uh, what Bruce is saying. If you say 70% of the volume is automated trading, that, well, really, that everything is high-frequency trading. I mean, high-frequency trading to me would be uh, anything that is faster than somebody could do manually. And so that doesn't mean you're trading 50 billion shares. It, it just means that the automated trading system and um, that's basically where our trading environment is today, is that anybody that is in our business to some degree is at least looking at being automated. And so that's going to be important to going forward um, with the systems being connected to the exchange and whether you're going to have a continue to have a growth of ECNs or you're going to have consolidation there. Um, who am I connecting to? Uh, stuff like that. And so I was actually wondering how high frequency or <laughs> allow me to say automated trading has affected them too, yeah. uh, if I may, if we get there. Yeah, but that, uh, no, <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you what, let's segue right into okay. that. <laughs> From okay. an exchange point of view, have you seen much high-frequency trading trading on your platform? Uh, well, sure, let, let, let me start. Um, if you are asking whether HFT is happening at Borsa Istanbul or not, uh, I would say not yet. But we know that there is some algorithmic trading going on because we don't ask members and their customers whether you are trading algorithmically or not on the order, obviously. But looking at the patterns, we can guess. As well as uh, in our informal conversations with the members, uh, th we know that they are working with some algorithmic, uh, mainly the non-profit domicile customers are sending algorithmic trading orders. And yes, it, uh, it affects, you know. Uh, although compared to U.S., the flash crash and all that stuff, uh, in a different dimension, obviously. Uh, coming back to technology, or which mm -hmm. technology become important, or what will be the technology of the future, I think it depends. Again, it depends on your company, it depends on your country, it depends on your exchange. Uh, for example, in our case, um, looking at it from a software, uh, right now what will be our technology uh, of future is the NASDAQ software, obviously, because we uh, invested in, we are investing in it a lot, uh, and hopefully we will get it in one and a half year time, uh, be, be ready, up and running. Uh, what are we trying to, or hoping to get out of it, obviously, is one is speed, uh, because NASDAQ has proven themselves in other markets, we would like to get uh, speed and progress to those markets, obviously, in terms of connectivity, the order processing skill set, etc. 
Uh, the other thing is a multi-asset, multi-currency platform. That's what we are hoping to, because we want one software to be able to handle uh, multi-asset trading and so on. I mean, obviously there are partition, there are different instances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but uh, as a software uh, support, we would like to have one if possible, uh, as well as resilience, uh, because the architecture that they are using is uh, what's called software for tolerance, meaning that. You don't have to worry about if one of the servers going down, you don't have to do anything special because there are, you know, architecture around it. So from a software standpoint, that's what we are hoping for in the next three years, four years, and coming back to HFT, we know that there are uh, customers who are uh, accustomed to NASDAQ technology in other markets. Uh, so we are hoping that they can come to Turkey uh, in very short time and they can be up and running in really short time and they can do HFT and algorithmic trading with us. From a hardware or other non-software <laughs> technology mm -hmm. components, as I mentioned, data center, colocation, you know, faster speed, because we know that our telecom infrastructure can go up to 100 megabit per second if we allow them to. But obviously, this is like a, a, a kind of a game uh, or when you open up the tab, I mean, there will be bottlenecks in other uh, places, right? Because if your lines are too fast, but whether your order matching engine can handle it or not is the next question, right? You should be able to, and then the next step is the back office or downstream systems like the market data dissemination. Will it be able to handle, mm. uh, as you know, NASDAQ had issues last summer, right? Uh, so we should be able to look at all the components together and make sure that they can go with the same speed. <laughs> That is both answering your yeah, questions. Right. No, that, that's good. And uh, what's also interesting is that you're looking at a platform with the NASDAQ platform that will give you that connectivity too, as we talked about before with FIX that's and everything correct, else yeah. that you're doing. So that's it's correct. you're positioning yourselves for that well, reach outside the community. Let, let really. me tell you a few things in that word. I mean, speaking of Turkey, uh, as you may know, uh, although there are some bad news on the CNN International, etc., for the past few days, but uh, for the past 10 years or so, Turkish economy has become a long way and uh, we have improved mm. a lot. And we still believe that there is room for growth. And the capital markets low, uh, interestingly, didn't follow the same or didn't enjoy the same growth rate. The capital market low is still well behind compared to other sectors, especially retail banking, for example. So therefore, there is more room for growth in the capital markets, I mean, including listing new companies, uh, different uh, asset class trading. Um, so therefore, there is definitely, uh, we you can expect more growth in, in that story. As well as uh, the Turkish government has an ambition of uh, making Istanbul a global, well, I should say regional financial uh, hub so similar to du what Dubai has been going through. Uh, so there are also efforts in that space and Borsa Istanbul is definitely in the center of all those uh, efforts. So we are seeing improvements in that space and uh, therefore we may have um, a, you know, collaboration with our regional exchange uh, exchanges around Turkey. For example, we do own like 15% uh, of Bakü Stock Exchange. Oh. Uh, we have ownership in the Sarajevo Stock Exchange, Bosnia Herzegovina, and we do have also some other, um, you know, uh, investments into right. the regional exchanges, uh, which we hope that to be more re business with them. Interesting. Yeah, that's the other side of the picture, yeah. non-technology side yeah. of the picture. Well, what about the Bulgarian Stock Exchange w when it comes to this technology for the future? What do you see there? Um, we don't have currently any HFT on the market, even though there are a few computers sitting uh, that, that basically they perform uh, balancing functions. Our members, just in case, uh, connect such computers in order to make sure that there is exposure uh, saved to the inflation limits. Uh, it's a bit difficult to detect such computers because they don't trade systematically and the order flow generated by those computers is uh, rather rotational. And what we are seeing basically is uh, just certain orders entering our trading platform on behalf of certain traders, but we, we, we have no, uh, absolutely no idea if that trader is a computer or, or a mm. person. Uh, 
itself will be currently uh, the investment decisions are being uh, made by by the traders and of course the end investors no no hsc on the market but i'm quite sure that sooner or later that will change very good thank you well we have just a few more minutes here it's it's amazing how fast it goes <laughs> when you start looking at a few ideas you know it's because i think we could all probably think of a lot of questions when it comes to technology and exchanges and how they're utilizing and implementing them uh, but one of the things I think I'd maybe we could just spend, uh, we got about five minutes to give you a heads up. But uh, the last category that we were going to talk about today was this idea of mergers. And uh, it seems from you know, what we're hearing from, you know, especially your area, that that's obviously something on the front burner. It's something that the Bulgarian Stock Exchange has already reached out to other regional exchanges to do. Um, actually, I'm just curious. Bruce, Rob, about your opinions regarding, do you see more mergers as we look at the global patchwork, or do you well, see less? It sounds like from Ali here that uh, that they have investments in many other exchanges. Yeah. And so that it sounds inevitable. It's just a matter of uh, uh, how it gets done as far as regulatory, I would assume, yeah, right? <laughs> we'll see how that yeah. comes along. But I did have one question, if that's okay. Sure, I wanted to fire know about away. When you say that, uh, that you're not sure about certain computers and, and high-frequency trading, what type of security do you have going forward as far as, uh, you know, what the flash crash in some people's minds was a somewhat a sabotage or a bad tick? I just want to know what kind of security you have on your systems over there to prevent stuff like that. Uh, the flash crash, uh, the market was closed on, on 6th of May 2010 because it's an, our national holiday, but it could have never happened in Bulgaria because the risk checks that are currently in place uh, within the trading platform we are using a trading platform provided by Deutsche Börse wouldn't allow such things to happen. Uh, for instance, uh, what we have, the so-called volatility interruptions, means that if the potential execution price lies within a certain, certain uh, corridor, everything is basically okay. But if it is above certain threshold, then the system will automatically switch to an auction mm. and even after the end of the auction it's, it's still outside that corridors, then the exchange will manually call the traders and ask them for confirmation of, of that, uh, of, of that uh, trade. Uh, that means that we, we, we uh, would have checked mm -hmm. w whether everything was okay before going uh, forward. It is not a market-wide circuit breaker it's a, a, a stock specific, but after all, everything started from a trading in a single stock and then just uh, was uh, spilled over uh, again uh, across the entire market. Great, thanks. Yeah, in our case, we do have several circuit breakers. Uh, as far as I remember, one concrete example could be if a certain stock price uh, goes above or below, let's say 20% of the yesterday's closing price, uh, it automatically puts on hold. And then an al alert is generated, and a compliance person with the market operations have to look at it. What, why it is happening? Is it because of a news from the company? Is it because of some other things which has actually happened for the past month or so a few times? Uh, so that's one of the circuit breakers. But if it is in an actively traded security, for example, you may not get notice it. Uh, but we do have uh, again and. and several surveillance reports running usually overnight or uh, on T plus one, uh, several surveillance reports that we built in-house as of today. I mean, we will get again in that space NASDAQ smart uh, mm -hmm. product very soon. Uh, but we, we, are we look at them and if the alerts are generated, uh, a manual person needs to investigate and see what, what's going on. So as I said, I mean, we, we our world is slightly different than the US <laughs> world, obviously. All right, well, unfortunately, that, that's where we're going to be able to finish it. Uh, you know, before we finish here, I, I do want to thank the panel for sharing their ideas with us and perspectives, and I hope that you're leaving with some ideas and information that you didn't have when we started today, that there's some nugget of thought or ideas that uh, stimulated something for you or gave you a new point of view, or you may want to continue that conversation with our panelists as well, too. And also, I want to thank you for sharing part of your day with us. Again, the hope is uh, that we can all exchange information to 
guide us along not only in our businesses, but maybe some other things we're not thinking of right now as well, too. So that's going to conclude this session. Thank you very much, and look forward to our past crossing again. Thank you.